Hey, good morning, everybody. It is so wonderful to be here. I'm amongst family and friends. I know I don't know all of you, but I know some of you. And every time Kara and I come here, and this time it's Kara, I, and Eden, because we had a lockdown baby, so that's fun. Um, but we feel at home, and we just feel a part of this family. And I, what, what I want to do today, my big idea today is honestly just to take us back into ex exalting God. That's really just where I want to go. So that's where this is going to end. And along the way, I want to dive into the story that you're in and the vision that's been set this year around this idea of Selah. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the journey I want to go on. And before I do that, um, I just want to say something about Dan and Fee. Because he said something about me. I'm going to say something that he wouldn't say of himself. And then I'm going to apologize already for the story that I'm about to tell. I have never told this story anywhere, but I'm going to do it today. During the time Dan and Fee were in Bath, um, Care and I a few times found ourselves without anywhere to live. And Dan each time would say, why don't you guys just come live with us for a few months? So we would live with them, and Dan and he would come into town, and then they'd come back here, and we would just kind of squat in their house in Bath, and um, they would always stay in some pretty nice places. So we did very well out of here, and we enjoyed it, and we loved it, and more than anything, we just got to, <laughs> we just got to hang out with Dan and Fee, and it was beautiful. And there was one night where um, Karen and I were at home, Dan was out, seeing people, doing what he does well, building in the city, and Karen and I went to bed. And uh, we lived in this kind of apartment block. And to get into the very sort of the entrance of it all, you needed this fob, a key to like get in. And then you could make your way up to the flat, at which point you'd need to use the fob again. So Karen and I go to bed and uh, we sleep soundly. Probably one of the best nights of my life. So beautiful sleep. And we wake up in the morning. We come downstairs and uh, Dan's, Dan's not there. I was thinking maybe he slept in. But the hours continue into the day and Dan's nowhere to see. And then he turns up. I say, Dan, did you, did you head out early this morning? And uh, he said, no, I actually didn't come back. I was like, all right, Dan, what'd you, what'd you get up to in Bath? And he said, well, I, I came back, but I, but I realized that I hadn't got my key with me. And I was like, oh, man, that, so, that sucks. Did you, uh, did you go to a hotel? What did you do? You know, you could have called us. You could have rang the doorbell. It would have woken us up. We would have let you in. And he said, no, I just I wanted to let you guys sleep. Which hotel did you stay in, Dan? And he said, I slept in my car. That story has stayed with me and imprinted something upon me. Leadership does not happen here. Leaders are revealed in the manner in which they lay themselves down for others. And Dan, as a phenomenal communicator and upfront public minister that he is, I don't know many people in his position that would choose to sleep in their car just so some millennials can have a good night's sleep. Can you give it up for them one more time, Dan and Fee? I have I've never told that story, but Karen and I, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not joking here. Karen and I have sat in situations that have been difficult, and we've said to one another, should we sleep in our car tonight? Metaphorically, should we just lay ourselves down? Should we, should we just, is this a moment where we learn so much and we learn so much from Dan and Fee. And this leads me straight into to, to a moment as well. It's Palm Sunday today, right? Next Sunday, you're going to get into this church and you are going to announce with billions of people across the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ. We're going to announce it and we're going to celebrate it. It's the most significant point in the Christian calendar. But it's only as powerful, potent, and profound as it is if we make sense of today. So today we mark the moment that Jesus walked into Jerusalem, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, all right? And people, I love that you have the plants here, people were laying down their coats and laying down their palm, palm leaves. They were waving their palm leaves in the air. And that, that makes sense with its historical context. 150 years before Jesus rode in at Jerusalem, there was occupation in Jerusalem. And you might have heard of Judas Maccabee, who rose up. He was a priest, but he rose up as a militant warrior. He was given the nickname the Hammer. And he rose against the occupation with the Jewish people. And he overthrew the occupation, all right? And as a result, people used palm trees and leaves to celebrate this victory. To the point of its image and significance, they imprinted the palm leaf on the, on, the, on the coin that was used in the market as a reminder of we were saved from occupation. 150 years later, Jerusalem is now again in Roman occupation. 
So it's a new empire, but they're on the back foot again. They got the, 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 the boot of the powerful on the neck of this oppressed people. And they hear these stories about this man, Jesus, the Messiah. And they have Daniel and they have Isaiah and they have all the Old Testament prophecies announcing who the Messiah would be and how he would free them from their oppression. And so Jesus, the king, is riding into Jerusalem and the people are saying, this is it. Hosanna doesn't mean praise you. Hosanna is used only, the Hebrew word Hosanna is only used one other time in the Old Testament. And it's in the Psalms and it means this, save us. So as Jesus is riding in, they're raising the banner, the icon of military defeat in the air, military victory in the air, saying, save us, do it again. And Jesus is weeping as he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Why did he choose a donkey? Because the Old Testament image of kings and valiant warriors was a stallion, a white horse. And he chose a donkey because he was saying, I have come to overthrow the empire. But it's the empire that rests inside the heart of man. I have come to overthrow. I have come to turn the tables. I have come to bring victory. But victory will be done on the mountain of Golgotha. I will free you. Not from the Romans. I will free you from sin, death, and Hades. And this victory will last forever. It won't be some historical military conquest. It will be a moment that changes everything for everyone, anywhere, for all of time. And next Sunday we'll announce it. And we'll wave our palm trees in the air and we'll declare that he did overthrow the empire. And the kingdom is here and the kingdom is coming. And a day will come where the whole world and every tribe and tongue will announce it. And Jesus will have his full glory. So we have a week now. This is Passion Week. We have a week to join Christians all around the world to prepare ourselves for Resurrection Sunday. To create space. To remove from our hearts the callous religion that rejected Jesus right? And the egocentric empire that rejected Jesus. We have a week to remove those two principles in our heart to make space for his kingdom. Just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean we're prepared for his kingdom. All right, let's, let's dive in. Let's dive in. Selah. Selah. It's, through this, it's 71 times in the Psalms and it always exists in a margin. It's never actually in the body of text. And scholars have never fully agreed on what it means. It doesn't have any other context to compare it with, to reference it. So what we've come to decide is it must mean pause or something of that sense. Perhaps it's reflect. Perhaps the sailor is to make sense of what has just been said. The sailor in terms of language, like the Sabbath, right? The Sabbath. We don't do the Sabbath we don't rest to add more value to our upcoming productivity. We rest to remember our productivity adds no value to us. So our one day of rest resets everything. And the Selah phrase gives you an opportunity to make sense of what has just been and to make sense of what's to come. The Selah is the word that exists between all the other words. And I want to look at today, I'm not going to do this for very long because I, I do just want to get back into worship. I want to look at a, a biblical um, principle, this repetition, that for me is like the physical landscape of Selah, and it is the desert. And I'm not going to go through every text I've got. I'm actually going to hang out on one. You can open your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhones to Matthew 4, right? And we're going to look at Jesus going into the desert because this is a Selah moment in the ministry of Jesus, he has just been baptized. He's just been affirmed by a heavenly voice, his father. Behold, this is my son who I love and upon whom my favor rests. And then it says the spirit leads him into the desert, into the wilderness. And I believe it. Dan told me the vision for this year is Selah. And so I would like to kind of suggest to you guys that if we were to use a metaphorical landscape for the year that you're in, it's the desert. It's a space between places. There's a barrenness to it. Now, I know this as a poet and as a performer, right? When I'm, when I'm rapping, when I'm performing, when I'm singing, the most powerful, poignant part of the set, the most important part of the set, is when you hold the space. When you allow a bit of nothingness to hang in the air and everybody starts leaning in a little bit, like what's gonna happen next? In the desert, it's barren. 
Karen and I just drove. We drove from San Diego to the Grand Canyon. That was 500 miles. And then we drove the Grand Canyon down to Phoenix, which was like 300 miles. So we spent a long time in the desert. And it is appearingly barren. You know, there's nothing there. And yet there's this odd kind of mysterious atmosphere as you're driving through because you know it's teeming with life it's kind of like the ocean there's so much going on but you just can't see it and so in the space in the sailor everyone's leaning in like what's going to happen next and so the old wild man the prophet isaiah says in isaiah 43 he says behold speaking of god he says behold i'm doing a new thing do you not perceive it it comes forth like a way in the wilderness like streams in the desert and what I'm coming to believe more and more, and Jesus reveals this, is the rhythm of the spiritual life is to be led into the desert so that God can finally do something new. And we resist the desert. We re resist the sail out of space. I mean, let's just get really practical. The spiritual discipline of silence and solitude. When was the last time you sat alone? And when was the last time you sat silent? Being on your own, but being with your phone is not solitude. When have you been on your own and allowed silence to speak? You know, when have you been alone? And, and our culture pushes against it. And even our church cultures do. Because as, as in, a, in a church culture, obviously it doesn't apply at St. Charles. But in our church culture, we, just like anywhere else, we want fruit. We want success. We want things to go well. And so it, it impresses me that you've dedicated this year to Selah. Because what you said of yourself as a church this year is, we're going to hold space we're going to hold space to listen and hear what God is wanting to do. We're going to allow ourselves in different ways to enter deserts. And so what I want to do in this text this morning is I want to maybe speak into the desert that you're already experiencing and bring it a little bit of context because it's the first thing that Jesus did in his ministry. Let's do this. Matthew 4, it says that Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We, we could spend all day on that one verse. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. You know, we do Lent to prepare ourselves for resurrection. This is the text where that comes from. We, we, we dedicate ourselves for 40 days to prepare ourselves for the resurrection, to prepare ourselves for what happens next. So for 40 days and he's hungry and the tempter came to him. Let me just start with this. When Jesus announces his kingdom in, in, on the Sermon on the Mount, when he, when he starts the Beatitudes. So this is like a king, a president, a prime minister's first speech. He gets up. Everyone's leaning in. What's this guy about? What's this message? What's this guy bringing to the culture? And Jesus says this. The first opening line, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. And the Greek word for poor doesn't translate to the manner in which we think about it in terms of being impoverished. It, it more accurately translates as empty. Because when have you ever said that someone was full of themselves and meant it as a compliment? <laughs> Blessed are those who are empty of themselves. For they can be filled with the good stuff. Blessed are those who have learned what it is to have a desert within. So that something new can be born. And something new can come of it. Before Jesus preached that message, he lived it. He drew himself into the wilderness with the Spirit. And for 40 days, he fasted. And after 40 days, and I've never attempted 40 days of fasting. I'm sure some of you in the room have because you're those kind of people. 40 days of fasting. After 40 days of nothing, no sustenance in him, the tempter comes. Why didn't the tempter come on day 22? Let me find Jesus at his weakest. And he approaches Jesus and he says this. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And then Jesus says, it is written. Can everybody say that? It is written. Man shall not. And you imagine Jesus, he's frail. When he's lost weight, he might be shaking right now in the desert. The heat of the sun, his body is parched. He says, man shall not live off bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of of God. Jesus said only a few days, weeks later, very close to this time when he announced the kingdom, he said this, blessed are those who hunger and blessed are those who thirst for righteousness sake, 
but theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. This is bad news for, so, for, for someone like me who lives on the edge of gluttony a lot of his life. To walk in the way of Jesus is to remain hungry. To walk in the way of Jesus is to remain dissatisfied your entire life. Because you have eternal longings within you that external offerings can never satisfy. You will be homesick for the rest of your days for a home you've never been to. Because there hasn't been a deposit in your soul and you have seen too much. And the whole ploy of any marketing company is to keep you hungry, but it's a different kind of hunger. The hunger in marketing is to keep you hungry and dissatisfied with your own, your own life in comparison, in comparison to what someone else has. So every billboard and ad and social media thing that comes up is to get you enticed by what someone else has to devalue what you have and to keep you dissatisfied in that sense. It's a dissatisfaction which is rooted in comparison. And Jesus' hunger is rooted in conviction. He says, I have understood now that to be hungry is to be spiritually satisfied. Because it keeps me from complacency. It keeps me from pseudo comfort. He says in John 10, he says, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. And the word abundance is a Greek word, parisos. And it means that which exceeds your expectation. Fill my life with stuff and describe it as a blessing. I'll experience John 10, 10. But what Jesus is saying is, I've come to give you something so rich and so good. Nothing on this planet will ever meet it. But it will keep you walking this narrow path. And it will keep you ready and prepared for the kingdom. Blessed are those who are dissatisfied, for they shall be satisfied. Something you guys do very well here is cook meat. We spend a lot of time in, in, in Tennessee. We spend a lot of time in the South. And I love barbecue food. The longer that takes to cook, the tender it is. The longer it takes to cook, the more tender it is. And the worst thing you can do if you know you're eating barbecue at the end of the day is to snack. The worst thing that you can do to prepare yourself for that meal is to snack. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's time to stop snacking and it's time to remain hungry. So... so and you can define for yourself what snacking is right now. But I would say it's whatever gives you a pseudo sense of comfort, a pseudo sense of fulfillment. You might, you might buy something on Amazon Prime that you know arrives tomorrow that will not satisfy today. The hunger that you have isn't meant to be satisfied. When Fee was leading us in worship today, I got on my knees and I was like, oh no, I'm getting even more hungry. I'm getting even more hungry. I'm getting even more homesick for a home I've never been to. I'm getting even more desperate for this land and for this day. That's why Paul prays at the end of his letters, Lord Jesus, come soon. It's not just come soon to fix the broken world. It's come soon as a bride awaits the wedding day. Oh, I'm desperate. I'm falling more and more in love. There's a heartbreak to it, but it's not a heartbreak of devastation. It's like a heartbreak of longing. You can turn that stone into bread right now. And Jesus said, I don't want quick fixes for eternal satisfactions. And may it be the case with us, amen? And then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And then the devil does something that he only does once, and this is how he does it. He pulls out the scriptures and he says, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they'll bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Don't take any comfort in the fact that you know the Bible. Take comfort in the fact that you know the word. That you know the God who is born out of our understanding of scripture, our devotion to it. That, that this becomes flesh and living personhood of Christ the more we get into it. Just knowing the verse isn't, isn't it? Knowing who the verses lead us to. It says, it says in the script, I love this. The word of God is living and active. It's like a double-edged sword that pierces through bone and marrow. What you see here in this text is the devil quoting scripture. And what you see in this text is Jesus living it. And I think as a church over 2,000 years, we've got a little bit, a little bit confused with that. We're not here to know the verses. We're here to live them. And Jesus says, again, it is written. You shall not put the Lord your God to test. Let me tell you what's happening here. 
the devil is trying to get Jesus to prove himself by his standards. And the, and the manner in which he's trying to get to prove himself is by risking his life. So there are times in our life, and you guys know this to be true, it's probably happened to you this week already, where someone has required you to prove yourself to fit their standards of validation. And it is very tempting. It's very tempting, especially when there's a promotion on the end of it. Or especially when there's a sense of belonging in a group to do something. Well, if you are who you are, who you say you are, then do this. Dan's preached on this so many times, but Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. To be meek is to be restrained. Blessed are those who are powerful, but don't use their power to prove themselves. Blessed are those who are powerful, but don't use their power to put someone else down. Blessed are those who know their power is most powerful when it's restrained. The devil wanted Jesus to reveal his power to validate himself. But Jesus knew the best way he could validate himself was restraining it. For any man could reveal his power, but it takes a man like Jesus Christ to restrain it and hold it. I haven't come to keep my life. I've come to lay it down. He knew that. He knew a day was coming where he would lay his life down in the way that he was destined to, yielding to the spirit, following the voice of his father. And this wasn't that time. God has called you something. God is leading you to something. And men will require of you before it's time. Hold it. Hold it. Let people walk by you. Let people dismiss you. Let people count you out. Let it happen. Restrain your power because that's when you really have it. And then this is where it gets, this is where it gets tasty. Again, the devil took him, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, fall down and worship me. I, I hate that, man. I just hate that. I just hate that that happened. Fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, and this is the first time he says it, and I sometimes wonder if, if, if Satan had 20 more temptations backed up. He says, be gone. And you can imagine he's, he's withering. He's so hungry. He's tired. Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then angel, then the devil left him. Why did the devil leave him? Because he said, go for me. He could have said that whenever he wanted. Be gone. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. If you can ask you in the band to get up, is that right? Just well, stay with me. I meant to open my notes at the beginning of a sermon. That's what you meant to do, but I forgot to. So I am actually going to do that right now. Um, <laughs> I wonder if since Dan got up and said, we're dedicating this year to this idea, this notion of Selah, this pause, this space between two places. I wonder if any of you have felt anything I've just addressed. I wonder if you felt an intensity on provision, like a sense of who provides? Where does my bread come from? I wonder if any of you have felt a, a temptation to shake, take shortcuts in that arena. And it doesn't actually just have to be finance. It could be anything where you feel like a deep desire for fulfillment and satisfaction. And this year has just felt that little bit more intense in that way. You don't have to put your hand up, but do you relate? And secondly, I wonder if you felt a sense of, I'm pressured to prove myself. I'm pressured to reveal myself. I'm pressured to move from that hidden state that I am in with Christ and reveal myself to man, but knowing it only comes from an egotistical value point. I wonder if you felt that. And I wonder, lastly, if you felt in this time a pressure, a desire, a temptation to fall on your knees before another kind of idol. To give yourself over in one way or another to something in awe that isn't God. And you know, you know the story of the golden calf, right? You know in those desert tribes, they worshipped a bull, right? They worshipped the, the figure of a bull. It's interesting to me that when Israel was in the desert, they fashioned a golden calf because a calf isn't as threatening as a bull. 
right? If you walk into a field and there's a bull in the field, you want to get through that field quickly or you don't want to go in it. But if you walk into a field where there's a calf, it's not as threatening. And idols come into our life not in the most threatening way and not in the most obvious way, but in subtle ways where it's, it feels a little bit more approachable. And before we know it, we see ourselves dedicating ourselves to the things that have no business being our God. Money and relationships. And you know where it is in your life. And this is why I want to end in worship today. Because that is what, that, that's where Selah leads us into. You know, the Psalms, Lord have mercy, confess. Lord, how long? Lament. And then finally, the prayers of ascension. The Psalms from Psalm 20 all the way to Psalm 34 and beyond. Lift my eyes, O God. That's where the Psalms end. And that's where this passage ends. And I want to remind you of something that just as we go into, into singing. Jesus began his ministry on a mountain where the devil offered him the nations if he would bow to him. Jesus ends his ministry according to the book of Matthew on a mountain. It's in Matthew 28. It says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee, the all the disciples minus Judas, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. This is post-resurrection, all right? They've been directed to go to the mountain. We don't know how long they went there for. They were just told to go. The rabbi said, go to the mountain. So they've gone to the mountain. And when they saw him, there's no context. They just go to the mountain. And when they saw him, was he waiting there for him? Did he just appear? When they saw him, they worshipped him. And the Greek word for worship, let me read it carefully. Pruskunio, right? And that word, it isn't a word, it's, it's a phrase. And the phrase means to kiss the ground. When they saw Jesus, they fell prostrate. And they put their physical bodies as low as they possibly could to the ground and he kissed the ground. And there's no record in the Gospels of his disciples doing that before the cross. They never got on their knees and just worshipped him before that point. But when they saw the resurrected Christ, the 11 disciples who had been with him all that time, they kissed the ground. And I only just started thinking about this as you guys were singing. Jesus was on the mountain with the devil where the devil said, I'll give you the nations if you worship me. And Jesus rebuked him, all right? And at the end of Matthew, Jesus is back on the mountain and he's being worshipped. And then he says to his disciples, I'm going to give you the nations. I'm calling you to make disciples of them for all, of, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And guess what? He knew that right at the beginning. I'm going to come back to the mountain, Satan. And I'm going to bring the same authority there as I have right now. And the nations that you think you can offer me, I'm going to give to those who follow me. And when I commission them, I'm not going to say, go to the nations and prize them out of the hands of the devil because they belong to me. I'm going to say, go to the nations and remind him that they've always belonged to me. Psalm 124 says, the whole earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Jesus knew that the whole time. So imagine that. He stood there before Satan. As Satan is saying, I'll give you this. And Jesus said, I'm not going to take from you what is already mine. Don't allow the devil to tempt you as if you are entitled to something that God wants to give you through your inheritance. Don't be the older son who said, if only you had given me a goat. Luke the, the last thing, the, the 12th verse of Luke 15, it says, the father divided his property between both sons. So before the younger son squandered his property, he had already given half of his property to the older son. So despite the gold he had been given, the older son only saw the goat that he didn't have. Entitlement will rob you of your inheritance. And Jesus was standing there as the son of God saying, my inheritance is the nation's. And now we stand before him as his followers. Sorry, we fall before him as his followers and we worship him. And as we lift our eyes to him, he says, now go and make disciples of all nations for all authority in heaven and earth belongs to me. Can we worship him this morning? Let's stand and sing. <laughs>